As I travel and meet with early childhood educators, whenever I mention the name Bev Boss, a light goes on. She's a legend and an inspiration, and it's wonderful to have her with us. Bev, you've been working with parents and with children for almost 40 years. Let's begin by talking about parents. What do they really want for their children? Parents want to know what's really right for their children, how they grow. I think we may have a whole generation of parents who actually miss their childhood, so they don't understand. I have a good friend who says that um, we are all under a spell. We're under a spell of how we were raised and what our parents did. And a, a spell isn't intellectual. It just means that we come with that stuff. Some of it was really good. My parents did the very best job that they could with the knowledge that they had. Okay, when we talk about child development, what are the basics? People talk about reading and writing and arithmetic being the basics. Those are very complex processes, and they have to be based on the basics. You have to have the basics first, then you can do what people call the basics. The number one basic for everybody on this planet is wonder. Children are born with it. You have to protect the toddler from themselves. They're so filled with wonder, wanting to know everything on this planet. All, it's, it's here. It's the thing that we have to keep alive that we don't. I'm stunned when I travel and when I watch people not to be curious about everything that there is. I, when, I, we, when we're in airports traveling, I watch kids, just watch them. They're fascinating to watch, everything in the airport. You watch a kid push a stroller. You know, we watch kids, you know, ride on the walking sidewalk, um, everything, riding backwards on it, wondering if they can go fast enough to do that. The wonder of everything. Uh, my two-year-old grandson, every minute of the day, he's looking for the moon. I mean, he hasn't figured out that it's only a particular time of the day that he can see it yet. But looking at the moon, he also calls a mumu, the, is the rainbow. He's always looking for the rainbow because he saw one once. That wonder of everything and being given the time and the opportunity to do that. Then the second basic is discovery. Everybody needs to discover it on their own. That's an environmental issue. We need to establish environments where kids can do the discovering on their own. I have a wonderful story about a little girl in our school. They invited me to their home for dinner. And it was a cold, kind of wintry night for California. And I went up there, and I knocked on the door. She opened the door, and as she said, hello, she saw her breath. And her eyes got really, really big, and she shut the door. And then she opened it again. And then she shut the door, and then she opened it again. <laughs> See, that discovery, those details in every child's life, discovering a grain of sand, what wet sand can do, water, the flow. The experiences have to be real and they have to be authentic. It can't be uh, a video. It has to be real. So the second one is discovering everything on your own. You know, I always think, imagine trying to discover how to ride a bike on a video. I mean, you have to do it yourself. You know, imagine the, if your first experience with, with Apple is the word in a book. Not seeing that long thing that your grandmother could peel off all in one. Not tasting it, not smelling it, not knowing it can be juiced. Imagine your first experience with orange if it was only a, a, a word. And we do that sometimes to children. We show those things on videos. We do all sorts of things on videos. They have um, CD-ROMs now of mixing Play-Doh. Well, at our school, you know, the discovery is that if you take flour and salt and water, you can mix and mix and mix. We start with 100 pounds of flour and 100 pounds of salt and just pitchers of water. It can be soupy, it can be runny. A dad said to me one day as he's watching the kids mixing and mixing and mixing, he said, do you think they're ever gonna get anything that looks remotely like Play-Doh? I said, I don't know, but I know they're not doing this anyplace else. They've got to see this solids turn to liquids, the graininess, and then adding color. My favorite story, about a little kid is the little kid who walked in the door and he said to me, Bev Boss, I need a head of lettuce. And I didn't, I didn't say, well, why would you need lettuce? Are you hungry? I said, what kind? And he said, it doesn't matter. And he leaned against the door jam, and I turned to somebody in the uh, school and I said, run as quick as you can. Get a, get a head of lettuce. They brought the lettuce back and he's still standing there with this kind of frown on his face. And he said, okay, I need a bowl. I got him a bowl. Then he said, I need some milk. 
I got him the milk. He poured the milk over the lettuce. And then he said, we needed some food coloring. He needed a few other things. And then he said, I need a microwave. I said, sure, we have a microwave. We took it, put, took it in there, and I said, for how long? He said, well, I'll come with you. So we turned it on. When it came out of there, it had changed a lot. You could kind of see through the lettuce. He held it up. It was limp. He squished it. He looked at the milk. He fiddled around with it for most of the morning. Then he took a, a plastic bag, and he dumped it all in there, and we sealed it shut. That night, his father called me. He said, Beth, what is this? I said, that's what your kid wanted to know today. It's what they want to know. And if you have an environment rich in materials, if you're listening and somebody says they need milk or I need this, you pay attention to the kid because kids have that natural wanting to know. The most important thing about that wanting to know to me, it has to be relevant to the child. Nobody else cared about the lettuce. It wasn't the theme for the day. It wasn't the curriculum for the day. But it's relevant to the child. If it isn't natural, relevant to the child, and physical, we forget about 99% of what we just learned. And so the, I pay attention to that. And after 37 years of doing this, it becomes easier and easier and easier. You know, one of the questions that people ask, they ask about discipline. And certainly, there's going to be some built-in boundaries for children. There's times when you're going to say, whoa. The thing is, in a, an environment rich in what kids need to do, there aren't those issues. When you look around your school, what are the most important things you look for? It's experience. Experiences to attach words to. Uh, and your own experiences to attach words to. You know, experience is not the best teacher. It's the only teacher. You know, you, I always think, too, as you get older, you take, a, you take driving lessons. And you have, you have to take so many before you can... Um, drive. You also take the written test and oh, oh boy, you get, the, you get to drive a car and then you get out on the road and you know what's real. What's real? You'd probably ding a fender, you probably do this. You aim the car for the first couple months and then you get a sense of what it's real about. You're real. You have a couple close calls. So it's experiences to attach words to. What we have to make sure of is that the experience is appropriate for the age. Natural implies, at least to me, being outside. But all of us, including children, are spending a lot less time outside. Why do you think that is? I think people have forgotten what's natural. It's the water, the sand, the dirt, the mixing, the stuff that my mother did. The only thing that I had as a child, because my parents were poor and they had eight children, those were the things that we had to play with. And our mother expected us to make our own way. We had loose parts, um, wood, pieces of wood, stumps, rocks. Um, we hauled things around, we built things, we argued, we fought. My mother locked the door. People always ask me not to share that, but that's what she did. I mean, she didn't want us in the house. And if you said, uh, I'm bored, she'd say, I'll find something for you to do. And that was the last time you said that in your entire life. You never were bored again. You made your own way. You had the experiences. Well, with the advent of childcare, and it's important. I mean, a lot of both parents and a lot of families work outside the home. We've gotten further and further away from that. We've gotten to plastics. Um, you know, ki kids need to make their own dolls. They need to make their own things. They need loose parts, pipes, and, and again, again, rocks and stones, water, things to manipulate, um, blocks. All math concepts are worked out in blocks. And then we, we got to the place where we're doing things like this. You can only build knee high. Well, it's no fun to do it. It's no fun to do that. Children, children want to challenge all the time. So what's real? What's authentic? And the other thing that I think is so infinitely important about young children, what we have to understand about them is that when they're, they're young, learning is like this. They have to use too much. It has to be way out there. Too much paint. Before they can narrow it down and paint a picture, they have to have too much paint. Too much shaving cream, too much of everything. Things have to run over. The glass has to run over a few times before they get the idea that, oh, you know, some places mark the glass so that it, the juice only goes so high. Well, what kind of fun would that be? Being in nature means being outside, and oftentimes being outside doesn't feel safe. It might not be safe. How do we deal with this feeling of not being safe? 
we have become more and more afraid of being outside. It's, it feels safer in our houses. It feels safer within, um, uh, to have gates on the front. You don't make places safer and really good for children by staying inside. We make places better by being in the community, by being out in the community, knowing our neighbors, connecting with them. You know, I see in this place parents coming with such a tremendous need and desire to connect with people. People are, you know, one of the things that's happened is both parents working outside the home, the women aren't hanging over the fence, talking, hanging up clothes, doing the kinds of things that they need to do. Um, so there is this, this lack of connection, of deep knowing. A, a, one, a person told me a wonderful story about um, two people that live next door to each other, probably the 50s and 60s, and they hooked a TV tray over two fences, and every morning they take their coffee out there and sit and talk. Those times are gone. We have to figure out ways for people to connect, to maintain a community, to understand um, people next door. There were people who lived next door to me as a kid that were characters. They were different. They were grumpy. They probably would have reminded you of Mr. Wilson's person in Dennis the Menace. But we knew those people. We connected them. We're not making the world safer for children by staying inside. And certainly when it comes to the brain and environments, we're not making it better by keeping kids inside. What do you think's missing today in early childhood education? one of the things we need to put back into education is intimacy. I tell my parents at the first parent meeting, I want you to know this. If anything happens, anything goes wrong, I will lay down my life for you. And I would lay down my life for your child. I will do anything in the world to help you understand your child. One of the things I won't do is anything inappropriate. But I think that that's one of the things that I do well with parents. I'm not afraid to cry with them, to hold them. Um, the, the parent meetings are intimate and they are personal and I, um, I put 150% of my energy into it. I have to tell you a really interesting story. I just saw a mother in a grocery store and she said, Bev, I wanted to come and talk to you but I, I knew I would start to cry so I just thought I'll just wait a little while. She said, my mom just died. She said, I knew how to be with my mother because you shared at a parent meeting, how you were with your sister. I knew how to be with my child, my children, because you talked about that. She said, my little girl, my mother died. She said, we were such a close family. My mother was young. And she said, um, my daughter cried for a few minutes, and then she said, what about my birthday? Her birthday was the next day. She said, I knew, because of you, the children are egocentric. And that she, of course, was still alive and concerned about her birthday. So I think one of the things that I put into the meetings is heart. I never forget that that comes first with these parents, how much they care about their children, that they would lay down their life for their child. Um, so I try to pay really, really close attention to that. Sometimes, you know, you don't, and you wish you had. And at, at the same time, when parents come to the meeting and there's these discussions and there's this talking and there's, they know how deeply and passionately I care about them and their families, then what you see is you see families connecting. Do you remember what Bev said? And what about that? And oh, yeah. And then what they do, too, is they'll come in the next day and say, Bev, explain one more thing to me. So you, little by little by little, you build those connections, those deep, deep feelings about children. Okay, parent meetings are important. What else? You know, one of the loveliest things in this place is the um, multi-age factor. We have kids two years, nine months, and we often keep them in the same place until they're five or six. And what parents can see is they can see their kid at two years, nine months doing what's normal, but they can also see a kid a little bit older doing something different. And the parent says, ah, you know, my kid used to be just like that. Yeah, that's normal. That's what kids do. I take every opportunity that I can. I, I spend, you know, 90% of my time with kids. But I always take the opportunity to mention to a parent, did you hear what he said? Did you see that? Come here, look at this, watch this. Do you see him doing that? This is what's going on here. And I think that that's probably our greatest strength. You can't always do that. But you, you keep doing that and doing that and doing that. And pretty soon we have parents who understand and parents who go home and say to their parents, I want to tell you this, and this is the way it works.